Hello and welcome to the Prisoner Officer Podcast. This podcast is a place to talk about the forgotten cops in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do. In this episode, I want to cover what I believe are the basics of working restrictive housing. Now, restrictive housing is the newest catchphrase that refers to lockdown units. Some places call it segregation or the whole or special housing unit, CHU. Whatever it's called where you work, it's the lockdown housing unit for those inmates who either refuse to follow the rules of the open yard or those inmates who have checked in from fear or debts they may have accumulated. And many of these basics are also going to be very relevant to working mental health units or high security units. One of the places that I preferred to work as a correctional officer was restrictive housing or SEG. Um, I liked that the rules and the policies were set in stone. I'm a very black and white person. I believe in right and wrong, yes and no. Um, So it was an easier place for me to work because the rules that were put in place were very standardized and we did it the same way every day. And that's what makes segregation safe. And after several years of working in segregation, you know, I was asked to be the number one in the unit. I did that for many years and enjoyed it. Um, I do believe I was probably kind of a taskmaster. And there's going to be, if you ask around, there's probably a lot of people that will tell you uh, Cantrell liked things a certain way. He was a taskmaster. And I believe that I was because I believe that's what keeps segregation safe. So what kind of officer do you want working in segregation, I guess, is where to start. What kind of officer are you looking for? Well, in my opinion, you're looking for someone with a a positive attitude who wants to come to work every day, who wants to work when they come to work every day. A, A strong work ethic is essential for someone who's working in a segregation unit. And not just because there's so much work there to do, but because You know, you have a team in a segregation unit. Um, The staff in the unit work together as a team. If one person's lazy, then somebody else has to pick that up. So the last thing you want in there is someone who's lazy or someone who doesn't want to pull their weight. Being professional, a professional bearing is critical when working in segregation. And sometimes that's hard for people. Segregation is one of the places that the inmates are going to try to get at you mentally the worst. Uh, They're going to come at you with every name, everything that they can think of to say to try to get a reaction or an emotion out of you. So being able to have a professional bearing at all times is also critical. Another thing I look for in an officer who's working segregation is someone who knows policies. I need someone who doesn't have to stop and think about policy, whether it's right, whether it's wrong. They need to know their policy. This is what we do here. Uh, There's no guessing to it because you can't guess. Don't ever assume anything when you're working in restrictive housing. Either you have someone check it that you trust, who you can, you know, verify, or you go verify yourself. Um, Too many times people try to do shortcuts and they try to get around the rules And if you don't verify that or have someone that you truly trust verify it, that's how things start to fall apart in a segregation unit. There's no room for shortcuts in a segregation unit. Every day, you have to do things the same, with the exception of rounds. Of course, you don't want to get a pattern going with your your security rounds. But inmates should be able to count on the fact that if laundry happens on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that unless there's some huge problem, laundry is going to happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays. When we don't give the inmates uh, what they've got coming, that's where the problems start. When they can't count that things are going to happen the way they're supposed to, when they're supposed to happen, this causes stress on the inmates that we have in those cells. And that stress is going to turn into them sitting around, stewing about it until they lash out. And who do you think they're going to lash out at? It's going to be us. We're the only people they see. So no shortcuts. Don't get complacent when working um, restrictive housing. 
It's important that you do it the same way every day and that it's done to the highest level. One of the most important things that we do in our restrictive housing unit is rounds and counts. You know, they kind of go together there. Um, we have to do those and we have to do them the correct way. You know, I believe most places are looking at 30 minutes as rounds. Sometimes you may have to make rounds more often, depending on if you've got, you know, inmates on suicide watch, or maybe it's just you need to make more rounds sometimes because you can tell that something's going on in that unit. Um, nothing says that if you're supposed to do rounds every 30 minutes that you can't hop up and, and do it after 10 minutes. You know, a lot of things happen in that 30 minutes between when you've gotten up and done the rounds. And I can't believe I say this, but counts, counts are the one thing that, you know, it's the mainstay of working in corrections and they have to be done. You know, when I was a new lieutenant, um, I got access to the cameras and I had a, a senior lieutenant who sat down and showed me, you know, how to look through the cameras and they had these, uh, trackers on there that would show you when movement happened on the camera. So I'm learning how to use this camera system and I'm looking and I start to notice that in this one housing unit, nothing has moved for several hours, you know, and these cameras will pick up a cockroach that, you know, walks across the, the, the camera lens. But in this one housing unit, nothing had happened for a while. And I called him over and I'm like, you know, explain this to me. I'm, I'm seeing here, it shows that nobody's gotten up and moved around in this housing unit. And it was a midnight shift. Well, as we got to look into it, um, we found out that the staff didn't do their counts. There were two staff members who didn't do their counts. The one in the housing unit and the one who was supposed to come from another area to help them count. And up until that moment, and I probably had 10 years in corrections, up until that moment, I didn't know that there were staff who didn't count. That never crossed my mind. It never, I, I can't imagine going to work as a correctional officer and not doing a count. But it happens. I've seen that it happens. And unfortunately, over the years, I've had to deal with staff who didn't do their counts. So when I say counts must be conducted, they have to be. You've got to get up, make sure those inmates are there. It's not just for the inmate safety, which is what you're charged with, but it's also for your peace of mind and your safety. Because if things go bad during that time um, and the questions start coming, who's going to have to answer those? You are. So counts and rounds, um, two things that have to be done. They have to be done well. Uh, don't do your rounds the same way every time. Remember, you know, those inmates are watching you. Um, mix it up. Don't let them pattern you as you're doing those rounds. You know, it's an important part of security. Inmates try to figure out when we're going to do a round, when we're going to go to lunch, and that's usually when the bad things happen. They try to plan contraband, um, you know, moving contraband. They try to plan escapes. They try to plan a lot of stuff around our patterns. So don't do it the same way every time. And speaking of security in a special housing unit or a segregation unit, you know, um, a couple of the places that often get forgotten but are areas that we need to pay special attention to. One of those is laundry carts. You know, laundry carts come in and out of segregation all week long. Are we shaking those down? Are we turning them over? Are we doing a thorough shakedown? Are we, are we going through the laundry that does come in? Or are we just, you know, running our hand through there and then pushing it off to the orderly and letting them sort it out? Laundry is probably one of the bigger ways that I've seen that contraband comes into your restrictive housing units. So those carts, shake them down. Crews, facility crews, I don't know how you do it at your your institution or your, your correctional facility, but facility crews, those inmates, if they're bringing inmates in, they need to be visually searched every time, in and out, because we don't just care if they're bringing stuff in to our special housing unit. We care if they're taking stuff back out. 
because that communication back to the yard is almost as important as those inmates in segregation as the communications that are coming in or the contraband that's coming in. So those facility crews or orderlies or um, those type of inmates that may be escorted with staff, special attention and visually searched in and out of the unit every time uh, to make sure there's no movement of that contraband. Of course, the other big one is food carts. You guys know this. Food carts come in three times a day, and inmates do a lot of the preparation of the food, of the trays. Um, So it's super important that we pay attention to what's coming in on those food carts. You know, they're going, inmates in food service are going to hide notes in food. They're going to tape uh, bundles of stuff up under the food cart. Uh, they're going to hide it. They're, they're, they have time sometimes in the uh, food service areas to actually make little hiding areas in the food carts. Three special areas of attention. Facility crews, uh, or inmate crews that come in, laundry carts, and then food carts. And speaking of food carts, let's talk about feeding for a minute. Feeding of inmates in shoe is probably one of the most demanding and one of the most important responsibilities of your shift. Uh, Right below counts. Counts and rounds and then feeding is the other thing that we do that we have to get right. Um, We talked about shaking down those food carts. Let's also make sure that these inmates are getting what they've got coming here. Um, If you look at trays and they don't look right, get a hold of food service. If you look at trays and these inmates aren't getting what they've got coming, report it to your supervisor. Nothing causes more problems in restrictive housing than food. And if you've worked there, you know this. Probably, I don't know, 70% of the gripes that you get during the day have to do with food. How much food, the temperature of the food, um, whether or not somebody touched their food. So what we do in, during feeding is extremely important and we have to be aware of the fact that they don't have the inmate in that cell doesn't have any control whatsoever over what comes in that cell to them food wise they have to take what's coming that day with that said put yourself in that situation and i'm not talking about whether or not they should have beans today or green beans tomorrow i'm talking about How would you like it if you felt like somebody had touched or messed with your food? How would you like it if you didn't think the food was prepared well? You know, we talked about searching the laundry carts and the food carts, but let's talk about searching some of the other areas, you know, inside of segregation. You know, I believe that all areas within uh, segregation should be searched weekly. That includes cells, that includes showers, that includes food service area, that includes your sally ports. All areas should be shook, shaken down no less than weekly. And with that, you know, that includes doing your bar taps, your window checks, um, you know, checking the door jams, making sure that things aren't tampered with. These, these inmates are slick. I've watched them over the years. I've found um, multiple pieces of contraband where they've pulled out a piece of caulk and hit a cuff key in there where they've, you know, got the toilet lifted up just enough that you can slide the shank they've made underneath that toilet. When I talk about searching segregation, I'm not just talking about the hard contraband. You know, allowing excessive contraband into segregation causes problems. It causes problems for everybody. You know, if you've given an inmate a couple of extra rolls of toilet paper and he's quiet on your shift, that sounds fine. Hey, he's being quiet. The only thing that took was an extra roll of toilet paper. But if you're the officer on the midnight shift when this inmate has decided to stay up all night or when he's made some hooch and he's decided to get drunk and and cover the windows and he's got all this toilet paper to cover the windows and cover the cameras with to plug the bottom of the door so that he can flood, um, that extra roll of toilet paper becomes a very big deal. You know, here's my rule for segregation. Every time I do a cell search, something comes out of that cell. I don't ever do a cell search that I don't take something from the inmate. Um, Now, whether that's a ketchup packet that he kept off his tray, 
or whether it's hard contraband, whether it's an extra roll of toilet paper, whether he has four sheets and he's allowed two, I'm taking two of those. If there's trash in that cell, I'm taking it. Um, a lot of people are going to think, well, that's just petty. You know, why, why would you do that kind of stuff? That's petty. And the reason I do this is because I don't want that inmate getting comfortable in that cell. Okay. An inmate who thinks he can keep whatever he wants, he can make his little chess pieces out of toilet paper and set them up on the door. That inmate thinks he has control of that cell. That is not his cell. That is our cell. And if we go in there and don't take the contraband that's in there back out, he's going to continue to think that's his cell. But when he goes out to wreck or he goes to the shower and I go do that cell search, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to take some piece of contraband. I'm not saying I'm not going to go in there and take all of it. What I'm saying is that I, at least I'm going to get something every time. And you can't show me an inmate in a segregation unit who does not have some contraband in his cell. Whether it's excessive food items, whether it's something he's made out of toilet paper, whether it's a piece of sheet that he's torn off and made a clothesline with, every inmate has something in his cell that can be taken and should be taken. That's how we maintain not only control of our housing unit, that's how we maintain sanitation of that housing unit. Um, which is just so important. You know, the next point I want to bring up is uh, restraints. And restraints are, uh, you know, they're a subject of contention oftentimes in segregation units. And they shouldn't be. We should be putting on those cuffs the same way every time. Inmates don't dictate um, how we put on cuffs. They don't dictate whether or not they get double cuffed or big boy cuffed or, uh, you know, cuffed in front. Um, none of them seem to be able or, or try to convince us at least that they can't get both hands through the tray slot so that they can get cuffed. Well, that's just not true. If you've been around corrections long enough, uh, you know that inmates can get down there. They can get their hands out that tray slot to where it's safe for you, not safe for them. Don't ever reach in that tray slot where it's safe for you to apply cuffs to them. How should we apply cuffs? Well, inmates should have the backs of their hands together. They should have their thumbs up, right? And then after we get the cuffs on them in that manner, what's the next thing we do? Deadlock. We always deadlock cuffs. And that's not just a restrictive housing thing. If you're on the yard and you cuff an inmate, deadlock those cuffs. This decreases the chance that they can manipulate them, that they can pick them. They should, cuffs, anytime we apply them, should be deadlocked, okay? When we place restraints on an inmate, what's the next thing we do? As soon as we bring them out of that cell, what do we do? We're gonna pat search them, we're gonna metal detect them. Once you place the cuffs on, you watch through the door, you make sure that you keep eyes on that inmate and eyes on those restraints as that door opens, right? Because the minute you lose sight of the restraints, you don't know if they're still secure or not. So you're going to keep eyes on the restraints. That door's going to open. You're going to back that inmate out. And the first thing you're going to do is pat search him and metal detect him. Because the most important thing to you at that moment is knowing what that inmate has or does not have on him. Right? We need to know if he's got a weapon. We need to know if he's got contraband. And the only way we're going to find that out is to put hands on them. We've got to pat search, a thorough pat search. And then we screen with a handheld metal detector. And pay particular attention. Do you make them lift their feet? Get the bottoms of those feet. So many inmates hide stuff in the bottoms of their shoes. Make them lift these feet at one at a time and run that metal detector over it. You know, if you're squeamish about, you know, groins and, and butts, Maybe this isn't the place for you. We've got to be able to not only pat search up in that groin. I'm not talking about anything that has to do with Priya. You're not trying to sexually touch this inmate, but inmates hide stuff up in their groin way high. And the higher they put it, the less likely it is for staff to find it because we get nervous. Where else do they hide stuff? They heads to hide stuff between their buttocks, right? Run that metal detector back there. 
We're not doing anything sexual. We're doing a thorough search. And just remember, my rule for metal detecting and pat searches in restrictive housing is every time they come out from behind a door. Now that doesn't mean just when they come out of their cell. If you take that inmate out of their cell, you move them to the shower, and they come out of the shower, you're going to pat search and metal detect again. If they go out to a recreation cage and they come out, you're going to pat search and metal detect them again. This should be so routine that they know it's going to happen every time they come out from behind a door. That's how we keep control of contraband in our restrictive housing units. It's how we keep control and safety for everybody involved, not only for the staff, but for the inmates too. We have to stop the weapons and the movement of contraband in our restrictive housing units. Once we do that, everything's safer for everybody involved. So we've covered a lot of things here, you know, that have to do with um, restrictive housing unit, uh, restraints, feeding, you know, just the basic sanitation, rounds and counts. And I'm going to go over just a couple of, you know, what I think are best practices um, when you work in a restrictive housing unit. You know, communication is key. If you lack the ability to communicate, or if you can't say no, working in restrictive housing may not be for you. Now, I'm not saying that you can't say yes when you work in a restrictive housing unit. As a matter of fact, you should say yes to everything that they've got coming. If they've got laundry exchange twice a week, they should get laundry exchange twice a week. If they've got book cart three times a week, they should get book cart three times a week. That's what keeps our housing unit running smooth. It's what keeps it running with no problems. So the more we can do that, the more we can communicate with those inmates and they can feel like they're communicated with, the better things will be for us. Another thing about working with inmates in a segregation unit, and I'm going to expand this even to say this has to do with any housing unit in the correctional center you're working in, is knowing your inmates. There shouldn't be anybody on your walk that you don't know, um, you know, what their history is. Do they have a history of violence against staff? When are, when's their next review coming up? When's their next segregation review coming up? What did they do to get in there? You know, all these are things that you need to know about that inmate in order to do your job on that walk. Who do they run with? Who are they trying to communicate with? Who's trying to communicate with them? All of these little pieces of a puzzle give you the advantage when you're working that housing unit. You know, I had a former captain tell me one time, and he's absolutely right, um, that he could walk into any SEG unit and immediately tell you how it was being ran from the moment he walked in the door. And it was all based on sanitation. Sanitation is the first impression when people walk into your segregation unit. If you walk in and the first things you see are trash on the floor, or marks on the walls, um, food trays laying about, you know, clotheslines going between the window and the cell door, there's more going on in that housing unit than just poor sanitation. Poor sanitation is just the tip of the iceberg. From there, you've got complacency here. If you've got staff who can't enforce the rules of sanitation, then you've got staff who aren't enforcing rules for anything else. This is probably, if you look around, you're going to find that you've got orderlies out. They're not being supervised. You're going to find that inmates are getting favoritism. Some are getting some, you know, an extra tray. Some aren't. When you see this poor sanitation, you will almost always see it as an indication of bigger problems in a segregation unit. So pay attention to that. Poor sanitation, you know, I spoke about this earlier. Poor sanitation is basically a unit where inmates are in charge. You know, they're the ones dictating what's going on in this unit. Does that, does that resonate with everybody? The inmates are dictating how this unit is being ran. And we can't allow that. Well, I hope some of that uh, makes sense, you know. This is my opinion from years of working segregation. Um, these are the things that I see over and over and over again that make a difference in a special housing unit. Hopefully that'll help some of you rookies out there. Uh, 
If you run a housing unit with some of these things in mind, you're going to have a lot less problem, a lot less stress, a lot less floods, a lot less fights. And um, if you're not a rookie and you're one of the senior staff out there, hopefully this will give you a little jog in your memory about some of the complacency that may be, might be going on in your unit. With that, I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, www.theprisonofficer.com, uh, if you haven't been to the podcast page, I'd love you to go there and take a look. Um, I've created a section there with some of my favorite prison and leadership books. Uh, if you'll click on the cover, it'll take you directly to Amazon. You can order the book from there. And if you haven't already, check out the Prisoner Officer Podcast on Facebook. And click that little follow button, leave us a message or a review. Um, and if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Google or Spotify, click the subscribe button. Remember, if you enjoy these podcasts and you'd like to see uh, that continue, the best thing you can do to help us is, is share. Share with your friends, share with your family, share with your coworkers, and um, we'll get the word out. Till next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls. 